Buenas Sen Hockaday, I'm Senator Regine Bisco Lee from the 34th Guam Legislature. I'm Roland Kedwa with the University of Guam Cooperative Extension. I'm Misty Conrad. I'm uh, an associate director of CIS, uh, part of energy, and I'm also from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Peggy Denny. I'm administrator of the Ad Recycle Program. Uh, good afternoon, Peter Houck, uh, coral and fisheries researcher with the University of Guam Marine Laboratory. Uh, Elsa the Moulinat, Associate Director for Natural Resources with the Center for Island Sustainability at the University of Guam. Maybe, maybe we don't really need to be punched on the couch. Maybe somebody would like to sit at the chair. Fran is going to be on the, on the floor, so, you know, she's going to be roaming. So if you have a comment on the question. So are we almost ready with the right code or not really? Not really? Almost. Um, there we are. Okay, so, so take a picture of the code. One of the things that we wanted to try to do in this conference is really try new things. And so you'll see in the agenda for the entire week, there's uh, various things that we haven't done in previous, in previous um, uh, conferences. That in, also, like, I know they were doing a seeds talk and there was a president's summit yesterday. And so hopefully uh, we're going to try this and we'll see how this works. But we'll have a series of questions. Who is our timer? Thank you. Everybody, please look at this woman here. Her name is Sefa. <laughs> Sefa is the timer. We're going to try to be, because we have a lot of questions, to see if we can go through all the questions. So it's very critical that you be succinct about your, res your responses to the questions. Are we ready? OK, just to test it out, can we see the first question for the test? OK, how did you get to this conference? By car, foot, bus, bicycle, or other? Press one of the responses. By car. One person walked here. That's fabulous. How did that happen? Oh, two, two. Okay, is that it? So only 17, uh, oh wow, everybody rode by car. Now, okay, what a, or exactly the vehicle. So now you'll see there's one person that came by a bike. That's great. So now you'll see. So when you when you um, press your, response, your answer, you'll see the um, results already. So I see we're still moving forward on the number of participants. Okay, but let's go to the next question. Can we do that or we have to wait? These are just practice, so. This is a practice. Okay, get the next question. The next question is, what actions do you think will lead to a sustainable environment? Can, can everybody see the, risk, the, um, AB, the options here? All of the above. So some of them are reduced household waste, single-use plastic, styrofoam, eat locally, and recycle as much as possible. All of the above. Well. Hopefully we have that. Is there something else, Peggy, that we should be doing for a sustainable environment outside of these things? Oh, what do you think? Exactly. Okay, let's that go. That was a trick question. Yeah. Great. So that, I guess we really, really need to read the question. Maybe everybody can pull the mic. Okay, so you kind of got an idea of how it's gonna work. So there's uh, 53 votes. How does that happen? 53 votes and 36 participants. I guess you can answer more than one. But we're just going to see. Okay, are we ready? Is everybody in the room ready for this? Please try to be as um, responsive and, and honest as possible, and then we're going to have the panels discuss it. Okay, here's the first question. Can everybody see? Any questions about, the, about what we're going to do? No, oh, so here's the response. The most is that uh, uh, recycle waste. Reduce household waste, eat locally grown food, and recycle as much as possible. Those are the top answers. I'm sorry? The QR code again. Can we have the QR code up again? Okay, while that's going on, is the QR code, do they need it again? Okay. Ready? Okay, ready? Okay. Well, 
While that's happening, I'll give you the question. On Guam, non-biodegradable uh, styrofoam plates and cups are often used at fiestas. In your opinion, what is the following statement best reflects why this is the case? It's too expensive? Is this the first styrofoam? It's too expensive. B, there are no laws or policies banning, banning styrofoam. C, there really isn't a need to change the use of styrofoam to using recyclable biodegradable products. D, I don't know enough about the issue. So please vote. Can you, can we see that first? Oh, it's on your phone, excellent. It's too hard and too expensive. That seems to be winning. Okay, um, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask an unlikely person. Missy. Okay, that's a good response. Use a mic, it would be good, maybe. I do have a big Um You know, I think there's a lot, gosh, I think there's a lot that could be, um, could be used on here, but I think a lot of it comes down to policy. Right? Absolutely. You know, without, without the use of good policies to kind of start that action. So maybe Senator Lee, you can respond to that. Because I know that that's a big goal of this conference is to have action in the community, not just within the room. Yes, absolutely. And I just want to give kudos to UOG and the Green Army for really taking an active role on campus to provide a policy. And I know you guys are really leading the way on that. And we want to join you um, in the Guam legislature. So I am we've drafted a, a resolution that we are circulating throughout the Guam legislature to start with us and make sure that we um, don't use any of our funds, our, our fund our appropriation to purchase um, sorry, styrofoam, so to use, um, sorry there's a technical word for it, po uh, polystyrene, expanded foam, and so we're trying to move in that direction and to limit the use of single-use plastics as well uh, within the Guam legislature. But absolutely, I think that um, two things, uh, two answers on this kind of struck me. And I think not knowing enough about the issue. So our community really needs to be engaged about how dangerous it is to use styrofoam, how dangerous it is uh, for our health and for our environment. And also from an economic standpoint, people think that styrofoam is the best choice because it's the cheapest. But really, when you think about the full life of styrofoam, it's not the cheapest. It's really costing us a great deal of, um, it's a cost in our landfill, and it just never goes away. So when you think about it in those terms, it's not the best. And so we really need to continue to educate our population, and then hopefully there'll be more and more folks that are armed with this information, and then we can work towards policies that can, can project that. So the biggest, um, in, uh, the response was really it's about too hard and too expensive. So whatever policy you have needs to really address that. that maybe they get a tax break, people that don't bring it in. Anyway, right, but I think it goes next, back to them not yes. understanding that you know people might think that it's too hard and too expensive, but really not doing anything about styrofoam is very costly and very difficult yes. for us in the long run. Great, thank you. So do do we like that? That's that's we're looking forward to whatever the legislature has. Uh, to prepare for that policy. We're going to be there to support it, everyone in this room. Okay, number two, the next question. Interesting, that's what most people think is too expensive. Number two, the question is, after nine years of holding this conference, in your opinion, what is the most significant change that has taken place on Guam to become more sustainable? What is the significant change? Vote now. So one of them is uh, Governor Fitzgerald from the CNMI had NATO. No action talk only. Elsa, what do you think? So you can see the results, and so maybe you can respond yeah. to the results. I actually agree with that people are more knowledgeable about these issues. And uh, I remember actually a few years ago, um, LNG was actually stopped at this conference because it was a, you know, like, everybody agreed not to do it and it, it never happened so I thought that was really amazing 
So um, that's one example. But I do, I do think that natural resources are highlighted during this conference um, in breakout sessions a lot, and I think that helps the, the community to understand what issues we're dealing with and how to conserve and protect those special um, species and uh, forests we have. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Number, let's go to the next question. In your, are the results, um, are you surprised about the results? Anybody? So maybe Fran, you could ask somebody on the audience what their opinion on that is. What did they learn after coming to this conference for a couple of years? Anyone want to answer to that? Answer to I'm one of the ones that doesn't need a mic either. I would agree that about people being, there's more awareness, but I also feel like we need to have more deliverables. And we do do a lot. I remember, because I've been every year, and I remember a couple breakout sessions where we wrote a lot of stuff on the wall, and we wrote a lot of things about what we're gonna do, and da da da, da and I don't know where that went. You know, we tend to, in Guam, we think meetings are where the work gets done, with all due respect. That's not where the work gets done. It's outside of the meeting. And we don't always close the circle like I feel we should. So I hope that we can, in year 10, um, you know, take a few of the, hey, this is an idea we had in you know, Latin, Latin number nine, and we made it happen over the year. As a, as a community person, I'm willing to help with that, because I'm not someone to complain and then not do anything about it, because I know it takes a lot of work and we have to keep facilitating it through the year so we can say next uh, March or April, whatever, hey, this is what we did. I would love to see more of that. I would really love to see more of that. Thank you, Heidi. Okay, let's go to the next question. In your opinion, what is the number one action you would like to, which is consistent with what Heidi just said, what a nice um, segue. What would you like to be see, taken on Guam to be more sustainable? Well, then you see the results. So, especially it relates to um, maybe invasive species point of view. What do you think? Oh, wow, that's interesting. Ballin said, make sure his questions are fair. <laughs> I'm a firm believer that um, a lot of good has come out of these things, and I like. I, we have great laws, you know, but we, we've always said this. We suck at enforcement. So what we need to do is we have great intention of creating these laws and policies. We need to be able to close the loop, as Heidi said, and let's be able to enforce what we put out there. One of the, the enforcement was actually not on there. It's really invest in sustainable as solutions. Oh. The last one. Oh, yeah. That's interesting, right? Enforcement is not, didn't get the most votes. It's really invest in sustainable solutions. But I agree, enforcement's a big issue. I, I think it's one of the components that, you know, we have great intentions, but listen, I'm gonna see him yeah. at, at the family rosary next week. Yeah, we, we don't wanna run into that. Yeah, so, and I think you see it a lot, uh, simple things with people throwing trash in the jungle, right? Oh, don't even go there with me. <laughs> but, in fact, the results show that we need to invest in sustainable solutions recycling, erosion control, recycling options. We just need to do all of those things. Yeah, I That's think that's- I think you guys are kind of cruel, giving us only one choice. <laughs> it's I know multifaceted. All of, all of the above is not really listed. Okay, great. And I also think that for the, the legislative action, I think we should work more bottom up, you know, especially in like uh, our natural resources, we should see what the people of Guam how they want to protect their natural resources, the most pristine resources, and how to protect these sacred lands all over Guam and protect them from development. I think that's really key. And that has to happen not from a top down, but from bottom up. So I think, I think with, when you're invest, I think that that's one of the things that we're all talking about. It's really the long term. It's really Guam's ability to invest in its own community. And I think that that's where there's a big gap. That's why I think people want to see more investment 
into erosion control, recycling options, and waste, right? Okay, number four, what is the weak link for improved sustainable environments and policies? What is the weak link? Okay, where is the, that, that would be question number four. Here, what is the weak link? The options are legislators lack uh, appreciation and awareness, lack of public support for conservation, public complacency, not enough science or research. <laughs> we're, we're, while, while this is going on, I'm going to ask Pete to respond to this and pay you. I think it's all of the above. I know, but that's not the... Well, we're just adding that. <laughs> I think that would be the most appropriate. But look at this. This is an interesting thing. Not enough research and science, and exactly what this CIS is about is really about research and science. But I think the research is there. Interesting. So maybe. So Pete, what do you think? Why is that zero? Yeah, I'm talking to Pete. Uh, uh, I. I don't know, I, I'm not thinking that the science, I mean, I agree with the whole that science is not being communicated at the right level for some of these specific issues that are out there, but uh, really I believe it's, I voted between the two categories of public complacency and uh, lack of public support for conservation. I kind of saw those as the same. Um, I just don't, I just don't, I just don't see it every day in day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Uh, you see a lot of litter on the road and then you see the village mayors clean it uh, and then I drive down the road uh, two weeks later, and then I see more litter there, and then they, they cut the grass and they clean it again. And I'm really glad that they cleaned it, but I just don't understand why people would want to see that trash on the side. So, so it's something about public support or public complacency. They don't care, or the uh, support uh, for the conservation action. That's my gut feeling. So, Peggy, what do you think can, we need to do to address public complacency? They should come help pick up trash and sort it and, and learn by experience. My goodness, uh, when, when you do that and you see the incredible mess that is out there at some of these sites and when you participate, then you start to take ownership and you learn how to separate and you learn what's recyclable on Guam and what is not. And I think it really helps to make a difference. Yes. Is there somebody in the audience who would like to give their opinion about this? I want to share our volunteer why they voted for public complacency. Okay, back there, Ronnie, and while friends walking back, you can respond. Make it quick. Um, I'm going to give credit to to Peggy because no one does more recycling than Peggy. <laughs> this 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 lady has picked up more trash and cleaned up more square miles of this island than anybody than all of us in this room. But I have a problem with her response because the people who are there picking up the trash are not the problem. What makes what no. makes the microphone? I hate the fact that we need more Peggy's. Yeah, I understand. Maybe we can. What what you know? I'm I'm going with what what he said down on that end. That is what in your right mind makes you think that throwing trash is acceptable. Because, exactly, we don't understand That's that. the problem. Yes. And, I, and, and we're picking up, you know, like, like, like you said, and Peggy's picked up places, you know, 10 times over. Yes. And it's like, well, is, it, is there mentality that, well, someone's gonna pick it up? Yeah. Let's go see from the public what they think. Um, I think I've worked, or I've volunteered. What's your name? Uh, Marissa Brown. Uh, I've um, volunteered in conservation my entire life, and still some days, I know that for myself, someone who's really fired up about conservation and sustainability and all the things, some days I'm tired, and I'll go to the grocery store, and I'll see this stuff that's in all this packaging that like, I won't want to buy because you know it's got all of the packaging, but I'm tired, and I have to feed people, and I'll buy the packaging, and I know the science, I know all of the things, mm -hmm. and still, someone is fired up about conservation, Someone is fired up about all of these things. Sometimes I'm just tired, and I'm informed. So most of the people that aren't informed, the people that aren't fired up, that's the complacency is very easy. And I think that's where we really need to what we really need to address. Thank you. There's another response back here. Um, I think Miss Linda over here was for. Where's Miss Linda? Oh, okay. 
That would be Auntie Linda to me. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say we need to have more enforcement. We need to deputize people in the village so people can give citation. You know, you see people throwing out trash. And I think we used to do that. I forgot which agency was uh, doing that. Maybe the mayors can do that and in their village have their own people be deputized and give citation and let them pay and pay the people that are picking up the trash. I don't know, it's just a suggestion. Thank you. Okay, we'll so, take one more comment. <coughs> Only on question four. No. I just want to share that I read this book, Fostering Sustainable Communities, and it's, it's about reducing the barriers. Yes. Um, and, it, you know, we, we often peg the community as being the problem, but we need to kind of uh, design our system so that they become a uh, participant in this. Um, there's something else. Oh yeah, the other thing is it should be a multi-pronged approach because we have government should take the lead. You know, in the agencies, they should be the leaders in recycling. And so many times, like, I see things get thrown in the, la uh, the trash can when it could be recycled or composted. And uh, government should be the model, the role model in this. Um, and as far as businesses go, um, I feel that they're also, they hold a responsibility um, to uh, incorporate procurement of green products. Um, and you know, there's so many, so many models out there that we can follow, like New Zealand, um, where they, they look at um, buybacks of, once uh, consumer goods are, are used, they get bought back by a company, they get reused in the, in the whole process of remaking that, that product. So you know, the, the, you know, the, the imagination, it's, it's basically we're limited to our imaginations. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. But I think we need to really think about this uh, complacency issue. Now, maybe that could be something that is, comes out of this conference. How to, what can we do about that? Uh, number five, what is the reason environmental laws are not properly enforced? Okay. Is the first lack of resources, no money to do enforcement? Lack of resources. So, um, Elsa, maybe you can respond. I know Roland wants uh, is an enforcement guy, and I know that he has talked about it. <laughs> but maybe yeah. you can talk about how CIS is going to do this when we already know that the and as a last speaker said, they expect it to come out of the government to be the example, and we know that that's almost. I mean. Um, funding for enforcement is an, always an issue. Yeah, indeed, and I think it's it's on several levels. You know, in, we have our invasive species, and, and then you know the recycling that needs to happen. So where do you pick, right? But I think we all have to work together. And um, like uh, Sabina was saying, the, the the community is important, like for raising awareness to protect a land or to stop you know littering. So I think it's it's. Um, yeah, together with the policy makers, we have to just be more, um, yeah, strict about people that don't follow these rules, I think, and it goes across the borders, you know, federal agencies and... Yeah. So, Roland, do you think that if we just, because it's not about, I, I always feel it's really not about it, about money, but it, there's, um, because when, as we increase the rates for the trash pickup, there's data that support the idea that people then ended up throwing it in the in the jungles. Is that a complacency issue? Is it just laziness, a ref refusal to give the government of Guam more money? What is that? I think it's a social issue. Meaning what? Meaning it all starts at home. Meaning when I grew up, when I was a little boy, I didn't throw trash because I knew that my auntie was living next door and they were gonna see me and everybody looked out for each other. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. There's a disconnect between the Chamorro culture and the Western culture and we're picking and choosing. We don't have quite a, a system that works together. So I think we as a community, wherever we stand, need to come together and say that this is the standard by which we wanna operate. 
obviously the standard that we're at now is not where we want to be. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and that's uh, the frustration here is like I said, you guys are cruel because you're picking one. It's everything, but it's got to start at home. But a lot of these jurisdictions, and I know in Sinai they already passed it at the house. You're sad. Go ahead. Priorities. Make priorities. And if we did that, because I don't think it's about bigger government. If we made priorities, we'd have enough money, we'd have enough people, we could get all these things done. Priorities is we don't do that. We right. talk about it, but we don't do it. So, so um, was that the NATO thing? Yeah. I'll talk more. Okay, so did you guys get that question? All these jurisdictions have, and in fact, even in Makati, there's a huge population and there's a huge population of poor people, and yet they still pass ban on plastic bags. And I know everybody says, but I'm reusing it to go use it for my trash can. I understand that. Oh, it's, this is, um, the response is competing priorities uh, as budgets. You know, no um, budget issues, and then now we're looking at uh, funds for the hospital and furlough. And, that, and so maybe, um, Senator, you can respond to that too. Why is it hard for us to set priorities? So I think that it's interesting that competing priorities came up and that's what Heidi was just talking about. But the more I think and about this issue and the more I learn about it, that kind of ties right into our budget issue and it's gonna become an economic problem for us in the future. And I know that Nico is here and other folks, Josh is here from GDB. And when we saw the numbers that they presented on research of why um, tourists are coming and returning to Guam, it's for our natural resources, our natural beauty, and things that you can find only on Guam. That's the real reason why they come here. And so when you think about environmentalism and taking care of our island in terms of our number one economy, that budget issue kind of goes away. You know, if, you, if we want to protect, we, want, we need to do what we, we can, everything we can, to really protect our, our number one investment. And so the more that we think about it in a more holistic approach, this is an issue that, that targets our economy, but also, again, the environment and our health. Once you take those top three things, I mean, that idea of competing priorities, again, I think it's just people might not understand it or might not have the, yeah, just don't understand it in a holistic sense. Missy? I, I think it's a short-term versus long-term thinking, and you know, we, we talk about it all the time in the energy world as well, but you know, sorry. Um, you know, it's like putting Band-Aids on, on a big problem and you wait until it festers and then it's something that you need to, to really fix and then it becomes a huge expense. And so when you look at things like this, it's really hard to kind of gauge, um, boy, this is hard for me to do, and, and boy, I'm gonna have to keep remembering every single time. I have so many reusables in my back of my car, you know, and, and I, I'm like, I'm going to keep buying one <laughs> until I force myself to take it in sometimes, or keep walking back to the hotel room to grab mine. Um, but, you know, it's just long-term thinking. We have a really hard time thinking about yeah. the long-term. And I think that's just kind of culture everywhere. It happens in the States, it happens in Europe. It's, it's we've become kind of a society of humankind sometimes about, you know, just the next few years. And we, it's hard for us to think about that longevity. And I think that right now, globally, we're really trying to make that change of, of, of turning into more long-term thinkers. So this question is interesting in that it doesn't really say that we don't have enough money. It's a priority setting for the government, but it doesn't say that it's costing me a lot of money and I personally will choose plastics. I think when I originally wrote this, I was thinking a lot about part of it is no choice. It's whatever wholesalers bring in, right? So that's another thing you need to think about. Okay, let's go to number seven. Number seven is a very interesting one. Here. Spear fishing using scuba is legal on Guam. Which of the statements below best reflect your views on spear fishing using scuba? This almost sometimes I feel when I was working a lot in natural resources, it's like a taboo thing to talk about, but we want to talk about it here. So I'm going to get, have Pete 
um, give us some information after he sees some of the results. So some of the options are, many nations have already banned spear fishing using scuba because it's an unsustainable fishing practice. This method is sustainable and Guam fishermen should be able to use it. C, is spear fishing using scuba is not a traditional method for catching fish and should be banned. And D is, I don't know enough about the subject. But P knows a lot about the subject, so. But uh, gosh, a lot of people don't. Yeah, I, I find that really interesting. So, so that's really good and that's, um really helps us because we just finished a project um, analyzing about 20, 25 years of the scuba fishing data on Guam and we have some good outreach uh, along with a uh, technical paper uh, that is coming out any week now, so next week or the, or the following one. But uh, in short, um, you know, scuba fishing basically provides you access to what is a natural refuge uh, for the fishery and so it's, it just doesn't, uh, it just gives you too much access to a resource that you're just it's, it's just not natural access to that resource. And so what you have is disproportional exploitation of some of your largest fish, which are your most reproductive fish. And what we saw in the data set was in the early 90s, I think 94, 95, 96, we saw this just just amazing initial decline that we had to use a log seal, which meaning you squish it in tens. You had to use, in order to plot this thing, it was just this amazing exponential decline where we shift from our large body fish catches to our small body fish catches. And so then, you know, uh, basically using up all of the resources as quickly as they can, now it's harder for everyone else to go out and, and, uh, and make their catch. Uh, and it also has reef health implications. Now, at the same time, it's highly controversial. It's highly controversial because there's people that are making money from it. And so uh, if you're in the industry, you're making a lot of money for it. And so to me, the solution to address it um, uh, is, I think we're past the phase where it can be organic. I think we're at the phase where it needs to be legislative, but it has to be inclusive. And so, I mean, you know, it has to talk to people and it has to involve something like a sunset where you, you, you speak with and appreciate all the views of the people that are uh, involved in the industry. Um, but, but it's not a sustainable method. Um, the, the, the data show that it's over exploitating and putting a strain on our resources, which in turn is impacting the health of the reef. So, so that relationship is pretty clear. Our research isn't the first to show it, it might be the latest but that's about the third professional piece of research that has come out uh, to really support that. And, and the third thing I think we need to do is have a group of people come together um, to support any type of legislative discussion that happens because it's a controversial issue. A lot of people don't want to stand up and talk about that. It's very difficult. The, I think uh, whenever you talk about fisheries, in my experience that the legislature is probably the best public participation. And I always felt somewhat sorry, not that sorry, but a little sorry for the legislators because they have to really decide what that, what constituent group they are going to side with because it then becomes a matter of are you going to be able to follow what a large, loud group of population says or this other large group of population that is very vocal as well. So um, does anybody else want to answer that or address that on the panel? Does anybody want to speak to this subject at all? Why it's hard to do bad spear, scuba spear? There's somebody back there. And then, okay. And then, while well, Fran's walking, maybe, Senator, you can. I guess just to add to what um, he was saying, I know that this is one of the things that the speaker had mentioned that was really difficult for him, and he was really vilified for even bringing this topic up um, for consideration in front of the legislature. And I have had, since I took office, I've had so many people come up to me and tell me that this is something that I need to do. And so I would turn to them and ask them, can you um, just write a written testimony and submit it to me? No, I can't do that. There's no way, I, you know, because my uncle is so-and-so and, and this and that. And so it really is challenging if nobody wants to stand up and, you know, or band together and stand up together, then it's really gonna be a, a challenge to kind of throw yourself in, in front of that. And I think one of the um, solutions is that last and a lot of people don't really understand it. Uh, Fran. Oh, it's Farron, but thank you. I'll no, I was just looking at Farron. I, I, just, I just have a camera on me now, and if I make a funny face, it's because my leg is numb and I'm just standing up really quickly. Um, I just want to speak to one of the answers about it being not traditional. And I recently had a conversation with an archaeologist, um, Judy, Judy I, I can't remember her last name. Andrew, Amesbury, yeah, Andrew. about what, what qualifies as traditional or not. Like, does using monofilament gill nets or tekken still count as 
traditional fishing. And she would say, yeah, she kind of leans that way, um, even though they're using motorized boats, um, not because of the equipment they're using, but because of the way they're using it. So we are a traditional uh, people. We are traditional fishers still. Um, I would lean against scuba spearfishing being a traditional me uh, method, although some would uh, lean the opposite way. Um, but the other half of the bit that we're missing is we don't have traditional controls anymore. We don't have our chiefs uh, anymore from the hundreds of years that have uh, been uh, occupied uh, by other powers. So since we're missing our chiefs or we're missing our cultural controls, um, someone that can actually speak up and have power to say, stop catching this kind of fish or stop catching it this way or this time or at this size. Um, since we're missing all that, we need action somewhere else. And now we just have our modern kind of government that we're going to have to uh, expect to uh, step in and be vilified if that's what it takes to protect ourselves, uh, fishing for our future. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. And I think that this is not going to surprise anybody. What's the main reason there's so much illegal dumping? Um, cost too much to dispose of trash? People don't care. People don't know where to dump certain waste products. And people like decorating the jungle. And Jim, may I please speak yes, to that? Yes, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> thank you. you. <clears throat> it's not the last one, let me tell you. That's hardly decorating. I think it's, I really think it's a combination of the first three. Um, we have, <clears throat> there are individuals who, who feel that um, Trash disposal is, is too expensive. Um, there are others who really don't care. And there are, wow. there are some, wow. truly, there really true. are. There, what there, are say. there are some who, at least with respect to certain types of recyclables, they don't have a clue as to where to take them. So <clears throat> if you're talking about white goods, if you're talking about TVs or batteries or any number of things, there are specific places, there are sites that these items can be taken to, and there are so many people who have no idea. I get calls all the time. Yeah, exactly. So, but there is a very significant portion of the community, I feel, that really doesn't care, <clears throat> and they just, they dump trash everywhere. I, I know that, that, we're back to the whole theme of, I think, some of the responses here. There's a large apathy going on in our community that we need to figure that out. Uh, I'm going to do a, a shameless plug. Guami, Guam Waterworks is going to be doing a fog. It's a recycle our oil. April 7th at the Agania Paseo. It's free. Bring all of your oil. When you bring your oil, we have a, a, a group that will be properly managing and they're going to give you all the information of where all the recycles you can do. This is a shameless I'm, Shameless plug for Guam Waterworks Association. We are going to do that. Yeah, I, I actually want to do a suggestion. I know it's expensive. I, I do agree with the first answer, but I think we should split it up. Like the, the, the waste that goes to the landfill should be like super expensive compared to oh. recyclables or green waste. Like where I'm from in Belgium, we were green waste pickup was free. And you could, you only had to pay a few cents for a full bag of plastics or cans that could be recycled. But then the cost was 20 times as much for one bag of regular oh, yeah. trash that wasn't recycled. And that may, and there were different colors of bags, so you couldn't cheat. So I think that would really make a big difference because now it's all combined in one bill, you know, and you can fill up that one bill like to the top and the other one, you know. Yes. So I kind of feel. We need to work more towards a separated, you know, I, and, and of course bringing it to the recycling centers could be a solution too. Well, exactly. That's the one thing that I would love to see changed at the transfer stations. I think that when people come in with unsorted trash, I think they should be charged 30 bucks a truckload at least. Right. But if it's sorted, then I think they should be charged five so, for the landfill waste, and then they take care of their recyclable. But then you know what will happen? We're going to deal with that issue because people won't care. You're going to turn me away. I'm going to dump it someplace else because I really am not going to have time for that. That's what our, we're, we're struggling with that. We're trying to do something. It's free to the public for all these other. So we're taking motor oil and cooking oil. 
And so, you know, it's free. And, and But they so can take that to the transfer station. I know the problem is people won't do it. You have to make it easy for people. Huh? Next question, next question. I'm sorry, we're moving forward. Sorry. <laughs> Here's the last question. Guam imports canned and bottled coconut water. Romina King is a big customer. Which of the statements below best reflects your review on the importi importation of canned or bottled coconut water? Man, when I was growing up, we never thought to even think that you should get that outside of a coconut. And also, you didn't drink it every day. This idea that you should be drinking it every day, I don't understand that. You only did it at cool Coconut feet. water is good for you. There's a lot of it's preservatives in the source of an electron. Oh, one minute, I'm sorry. Hurry, hurry. Okay. Please hurry up and vote. Say no to the rhino beetle. Is it a rhino beetle issue? That's our concern, Ronan. <laughs> While we're getting the votes. While we're getting the votes. While we're getting the votes. Okay. The options are yeah, the coconut rhinoceros, rhinoceros beetle has uh, decimated the coconut trees. Importation of these products is not sustainable. B, the products are unhealthy, unhealthy in the cannon bottle. Don't believe those labels. I don't know enough about the study. Okay, it's number two. It's unsustainable importation. Rollin, what do you think about that? Palm Sunday was very hard in our church. The leaves are awful. And it's because we're used to just having coconut trees grow abundantly and you plant coconuts by just throwing it out there. And whenever you need coconuts, you, we took it for granted that we could just go anytime to any tree around the neighborhood and pick it up. Now, if you want to grow coconuts, you have to manage it. And that's the difference. So I've had people come up to me, oh, it's mess tomorrow, let's plant 15,000 coconut trees. And I said, who's gonna take care of it? If you don't take care of it, all you're doing is feeding the coconut rhinoceros tree. But if everyone did their part by taking care of one coconut tree, you would not have to bring in canned or bottled coconut water. Peggy, did you want to say something about this? Yeah, anybody want to say anything? And by the way, this is compounded with the fact that we don't have a green waste management plan because green waste is where the rhino beetle is breeding. So if we can take care of the green waste problem, that's part of the solution. Yes, exactly. Who wants to start a business in coconut milk? I, I know. Also... <laughs> so thank you, everybody. I hope you guys had a little bit of fun. Thank you.